Welcome back. This is the Ben Shapiro Show, number 855-236-3228, 855-236-3228. Jessica in Long Island, you're on the Ben Shapiro Show. Go for it, Jessica. Yes. Ben? Yep, I'm here. Hi, how you doing? I just wanted to know, um, I've been watching the protests on TV, and the majority of people I see are white. How do you feel about them chanting Black Lives Matter? So, I mean, first of all, let me just say that the the phrase Black Lives Matter should be relatively uncontroversial because, again, it is true that Black Lives Matter. And I, I think everybody agrees that Black Lives Matter. It's the implication of the phrase that people are objecting to. The implication being that there are a bunch of people who think they don't. Right. The, the, the idea, you, you, didn't, you generally don't chant uncontroversial things. Right. People don't go out in the streets and chant the sky is blue. Right. People don't go out on the streets and, and, and chant we love children. Right? Like you don't chant uncontroversial things. So when you when you chant Black Lives Matters, the implication is that there are a bunch of people who don't believe that Black Lives Matters. And that's what people are objecting to. That's why people will say all lives matter, not because they are saying that Black Lives Matter less, but because they are saying, right, we agree that Black Lives Matter just as every other life matters. So, you know, I, I think that the implication of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is more than just the slogan, uh, the, the, the slogan itself, fine. But again, the implication is that black people are under existential threat in the United States. And there's a vast group of people in the United States who don't care if black people are under, under existential threat. That whole implication is what people object to. If it were just, you know, an obvious, if it were just an obvious truism that black lives matter, I don't think it would even be controversial that people are chanting it. The bigger problem I'm seeing with a lot of the white protesters is the, the attempt to expiate racial guilt by people who have never done anything wrong. So you're seeing videos, for example, there's a video going around of this group of people in Bethesda, Maryland, giant group of mostly elderly white people, it looks like, who are kneeling on the ground with their hands up and taking a vow to spread the, the gospel of anti-racism among their colleagues. And like, this is just absurd. Like, you're, you, did they do anything racist? Have they been pro-racist? The, the implication, so much of the media is built on the implication that if you are not doing this performative thing today, then this is because you don't care about black lives. So if you won't say black lives matter today because you were busy, or because you think it's perfectly obvious that black lives matter, and I don't tend to say perfectly obvious things as a matter of course, then that means that you don't think black lives matter. So if I don't spend my day saying rape is bad, that must mean I think rape is good. I mean, that, that's an, it's an absurd contention. But what the, the sort of performative woke virtue signaling from, from white people who are taking on sins that were not theirs, so as to take the sins on among a broader group of people who are not them. Meaning when you see a performative white woke liberal doing the, I'm taking on the sins of my ancestors, what they're really saying is, I am not taking on the sins of my ancestors. All the other white people who don't agree with me are taking on the sins of the ancestors, right? That's what they actually mean. And that's what, that's what's objectionable, I think. Right. Okay. Thank you. I so, appreciate the question. The answer. You bet. So, all righty. Elon, you're on, ben, you're on the Ben Shapiro show. Go for it, Elon. Hi, Ben. Um, I'm a legal gun owner in Canada. And on May 1st, our government instituted a firearms ban on a dozen different firearms and about 1,500 variants or so um, following a shooting that took place here in Nova Scotia. Even though the shooting itself didn't use the weapons that are part of this ban, the government used their authority to outright ban the sale, transportation, and use of these weapons without an indication of a buyback, grant funding system, or anything of the sort, and I actually own one of these kind of weapons. Um, you're aware that here we don't have the same rights afforded to us like in the Second Amendment, and gun ownership is strictly a privilege. But I'm hoping that you can shed a light on what someone like me who wants to remain a legal gun owner should do in this situation. I mean, I've been around guns since before my military service, and I don't really know what I should do. And this situation feels very unfair. So, I mean, the, the, because I don't know Canadian law, I'm a little hesitant to speak as what you can do within the bounds of, of Canadian law. What, what I will say is that, you know, it's two very different questions as to the moral right and the legal right. So obviously, if someone's breaking into your house and you use one of these illegal firearms to defend yourself, I do wonder if Canadian prosecutors would actually prosecute you on the basis of the gun ownership. There are lots of cases like that in the United States where somebody has violated some sort of minor gun law because they have a magazine that was illegal, but they were defending their business and they shot a bad guy. Uh, and, the, and the cops kind of go, well, and no jury's going to go along with that one. Um, but with that said, if you have a bunch of different types of guns, you know, the one that is illegal, if you don't want to get prosecuted, you don't use that one. And this is the problem with living in a liberal country. That, that, and by liberal, I do not mean free. Living in a, a left-wing country that believes that gun ownership is not a right but a privilege. So on your point, um, actually in Canada, you aren't allowed to use guns to protect your property. There's no like defensive property ability with a weapon of any sort, let alone a gun. Uh, and people have been but, prosecuted on that basis before. I, I mean, it's the, 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 the that's fully insane, obviously. 
Well, we have something similar yeah, in, in Los Angeles that you're uh, like, I'm not clear on whether in LA, if somebody breaks into your store and you shoot them, whether you're allowed to actually do that. Uh, that's not clear. I know that in a lot of other states, it is perfectly clear. Um, but uh, let's say a person breaks into your store and they don't actually display a gun and you shoot them. I'm not sure what the, what the story is there. So, uh, you know, th- these bad laws make for bad situations. That is for damn sure. Elon, really appreciate the call. Andy in San Antonio, Texas. You're on the Ben Shapiro Show. Go for it. Go for it, Andy. Hey, Ben. Hope the weather's treating you well in L.A. Uh, quick question. I'm going to build a quick background for you to make it uh, super fast. So um, my question deals with some history. Um, I'm a Latter-day Saint, a Mormon, and we kind of had some history in the U.S. with some persecution, mobs, you know, killing our leaders, burning down houses um, during the progressive area and Reconstruction. Um, missionaries were, were lynched in the South. Um, and Reed Smoot um, was the, the first um, LDS senator to be elected to the Senate. He actually had a big hearing uh, in the early 1900s and wasn't able to, to take a seat really for four years. But the hearing actually said he was unfit based on his faith and connecting to the church. Um, and I was just thinking, based on that, that history, um, it kind of meets all the qualifications for the, the protected leftist groups. Um, I'm, I don't feel like a victim. I don't know anyone in my community that really feels like a victim. Um, but my question is, how come, given, given kind of like the history, it's kind of like one of those poster child persecution in America stories. How right. come something like the Book of Mormon musical is okay today in the same way that, you know, like a Quran musical would never be okay? How do right. the left so kind the, of the, the answer here And not to say that, that they deserve that. No, that, that's right. I mean, the, 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 the answer is that for the left, being a part of a victim group does not mean part of a group that has been historically victimized. It means part of a group that is experiencing outcomes that are, that are not equal to the outcomes of other groups, right? That's what it means. It doesn't mean that your group has been historically victimized. It doesn't mean that your group has gone through, your ancestors went through something tough. It doesn't have any relation to history. It, it has solely and completely to do with whether your group is considered economically or societally underperforming in some way versus the broader average. Right? That, that, that's literally what it is. So Mormons are disproportionately high income. Mormons are disproportionately well-educated. Mormons typically live in two-parent households, and therefore they're not a victim group. Right? It doesn't matter that the history of Mormonism is replete with a fair bit of victimization. Right? That, that doesn't matter at all. In the same way, Jews are not a victim group in the United States. It does not matter that Jews are actually the number one target of hate crimes in the United States by all available statistics and with a bullet by like a huge margin. That doesn't matter. Jews are disproportionately well-educated. Jews are disproportionately high income. Jews are, are disproportionately part of, of solid family structures. And therefore, Jews are not a victim group. Asians in America are no longer part of a victim group. Does not matter that Chinese American workers were brought here and basically treated as slave labor at the end of the 19th century and in the early 20th century. Does not matter that Japanese Americans were interned by the hundreds of thousands during World War II. You are not a part of a victim group because Asian Americans are disproportionately high income. Asian Americans are disproportionately well-educated. So to be part of a victim group means that not, you don't have to show a history of you actually being victimized, right? That is, that is ne- I would say, necessary, but not sufficient. You have to show that you are currently not experiencing the same outcomes as other groups, that your, your outcome is, is not good. And therefore, because your outcome is not gr- good, we can implicate Americans history, America's history of racism, sexism, and, and bigotry, which is why you never see the left talking about America is historically racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic, with regard to groups that are that are disproportionately doing well, because that would give the lie to the idea that America is cracking down on the basis of group identity. Right? It's, it's one of the reasons why people object on the left to saying, well, you know, Asians have done really well. Latinos have uh, an, an enormous amount of income mobility. They're actually picking up on whites in terms of income mobility. Uh, they never say that Asians have actually outperformed whites in terms of both income mobility as well as wealth ownership um, and educational performance. They, they, because that would, that would suggest that maybe freedom exists in the United States. Instead, because the implication is that all inequality is inequity, they have to first identify the, they, they don't have to identify the inequity. They have to identify the inequality. It's not that all inequity is in, inequality. It's that all inequality is inequity. So first you identify an area where a group is not equal in outcome with another group, and then you just implicate in, in, inequity. Then you say this is because of unfairness. You don't actually have to identify the unfairness. You just have to identify the unequal outcome. That, that is the, that's the reason why Mormons are not considered a minority group, uh, a victimized minority group in the United States, Andy. Cool. Well, thanks a ton. Have a good one. I appreciate the call. Ryan in Buffalo, you're on the Ben Shapiro Show. Go for it, Ryan. 
Hi, Ben, big fan. Um, I've seen you post a lot about demonstrators escalating the uh, George Floyd protests, um, almost as if to blend the rioters and the peaceful protesters together. Uh, but in my personal experience, from what I've seen, um, live streams and being there, uh, many instances of police escalating situations, an elderly man pushed on, I'm sure you've seen a lot of footage. Uh, my question is, Shouldn't the uh, trained professionals be held at a higher standard than the angry teenagers? Well, I mean, the standard for violation of law is the same for both, meaning that if you are a police officer and you engage in extra legal behavior, you should be prosecuted for that or fired for it. Uh, if you are talking yeah. about a police officer is under attack and the police officer, officer responds to the attack, that, of course, is not the same thing. I think they should be held to the same standard. I'm not sure why a police officer should be held to a quote unquote higher standard than a teenager. Violation of law is violation of law. You'd have to give me an example where a police officer does something and a teenager does something and the police officer should be held to the higher standard. I mean, presumably police officers generally are held to a higher standard in the sense that they're not willy nilly. Like, like you've seen it repeatedly. Police officers are being assaulted with bricks and bottles. They're not running into crowds and just wrapping people on the head. But by the same token, you know, to try and presume that police officers are supposed to just take that sort of stuff endlessly, that police officers are automatons, that you can sit, you know, you're sitting in an NYPD cruiser and somebody's throwing Molotov cocktails at the cruiser and you move forward 10 feet, that you are now bad and evil. Whereas if you were just a normal person and somebody did that to you, like police officers are human beings as well. And treating them as non-human beings is a pretty good way uh, to, to make sure that you never have a, anybody signing up for a police force ever again. Agreed, agreed. I mean, it really, yeah, listen, uh, nobody well, wants to see. And, and, and as I've said, like, if you don't want to see bad incidents with police on a raw level, I mean, I said this today on a raw level, if you have more confrontations with police on a raw level, you'll have more absolute instances of the police doing bad things, right? Just because if you, let, let's say that you are over at a family member's house and you and your family member don't get along. Well, one of the ways that you usually don't have conflicts with the family members is not to be at their house. Well, if you go over to their house, there's going to be more raw instances of you guys not getting along. Well, if protesters get violent with police officers, there will be more instances of police officers getting violent with protesters. And also, if there are just more instances of protesters and police coming into conflict broadly, that's going to expose more instances of cops acting badly because you, you just have a, a bigger sample size to sample from. And that doesn't mean the cops shouldn't be punished for that sort of stuff if they do that sort of stuff. And, and I've seen some tapes of, of cops doing stuff that I think is inappropriate. Um, I think most of us have seen those tapes at this point. But yeah, to, to pretend that the rioters and looters and the police are acting in similar ways during this uh, during this period is, is just absurdity. And again, one of the things that we are going to have to keep in mind is that the police officers who are out there putting their life and limb in danger in order to prevent civilization from falling into the chaos that we've seen over the last week, um, we're going to need them. And uh, and the, the amount of time that we're spending ripping police officers who go about their daily work doing really unrewarding things uh, on behalf of the safety of, of citizens largely in, in high crime communities and largely in minority communities, you, you will get a Ferguson effect. I mean, Heather McDonald's has talked about this. The idea that cops are just going to say, listen, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to join the police force. I'm going to take early retirement. I'm not going to go into a dangerous area. If I hear about a, a petty crime, I'm not going to go there because what happens if it escalates and then I get dragged in front of a jury? There, there are some negative ramifications to treating cops more strictly than you would treat a civilian. I've definitely seen that, and I think I've seen a little bit more posting about the um, the rioters as opposed to the the police, which was why it, my question was. Uh, I yeah. feel like more people are talking. Well, I mean, about let's the, put it this way: the, I'm not uh, stuck in. I, I get it, but I'm not stuck in my house, and you're not stuck in your house today because of the cops. The the reason that you can normally go out of your house is because of the cops. Like the, the reason you're stuck in your house today, or or last night, wherever you are, if you were curfewed, was because. There are people who are running around and committing acts of violence and, and looting and arson. That, that, that would be the, the big problem right now, not the police officers trying to stop all of that. And that is not to deny the presence of police brutality or individual cases of police racism. Appreciate the call. We're going to take more of your calls at 855-236-3228. That is 855-236-3228. You're listening to The Ben Shapiro Show.